is our refuge and strength. Refuge and strength, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Ever present help in trouble. Ever present help in trouble. Good morning and welcome to the services of Greenwood Park Church of Christ. This is our second week of, of televising this. We thank you for watching. We know that, uh, that you are, some of you may be stressed and having uh, worries about the coming weeks as we go through this pandemic together. We just pray that what you hear today will be encouraging and uplifting for you. Um, we just want the elders and ministers and staff here just want you to know that we are here to serve you and that if you need to contact us just go ahead and do so we're here ready to serve you in any need that you may have uh, if you do not have our numbers or email addresses to the elders if you would just contact Vicki at 270-781-0700 she'll be glad to furnish you that information uh, if you would like to get the latest news and updates from the church, uh, there are three different ways of doing that. We have what's called the One Call, which is just a recorded message that you will receive, of course, through your phone. Uh, we have email and we have text. And so if you would like to uh, be signed up on that, like I said, to get the latest news and updates, just please uh, email Vicki at v.wallace at greenwoodpark.org or you can email carly at carlymillergp at gmail.com and they will get that information to you. The elders will be making decisions each week as to whether we'll have service the following week. Uh, that's something that we will be evaluating and uh, we just realize that probably this will be an ongoing situation for the next several weeks. So we just ask that you be patient and trust our judgment on this. Um, just to let you know a heads up, next week we will not be meeting. And uh, as I said, for the next several weeks, as long as this virus continues, the number of virus cases continues to trend upward. As we've seen here in Bowling Green that we've had several cases developed as of this last week. Also, I would like to remind you of several different ways of giving, uh, but before I do that, we just want to commend you for the contribution that was given last week. Uh, you all gave $13,075, which is just awesome. We commend you for that. We know that you didn't have much time to plan for the days that you wanted to, uh, how you were going to go about giving, but that's just a great, great testament to your heart and we appreciate that so, so much. Now to get back to the ways of giving, there are several different ways. Uh, the first one is, is that you can go on to the church's website and that's greenwoodparkchurch.com. And once you get to that page, you look up in the far right hand side and you'll see a tab that says giving. And this way you can give through your PayPal account. Or if you prefer, you can mail your check in to Greenwood Park Church of Christ, 1818 Campbell Lane, Bowling Green, Kentucky, 42104. Or if you just want to drop by the building, uh, we have a mailbox that's right in front. If you just open the mailbox door and place your check in that bottom slot, then there will be someone that will collect it. And uh, just want to remind everyone that we still have bills to pay around here. And so if you would be just very generous in your giving, uh, we do have a weekly budget that's just under 17000 a week. And so we do budget for programs that are going on, even though they may not be occurring right now, they will take place later on once this is all over with. And so please give generously. And if you run out of cash, we will take donations of toilet paper. It's been very difficult to manage getting the worship services together while maintaining the CDC rules. And so, but we will continue to give these lessons on Sundays at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. Sunday mornings, 
and on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. And Kenneth will be giving us a lesson today again from the Project 51 series. Hopefully the quality of our worship time will be uplifting and it will continue to be so for the next several weeks. We'll improvise new aspects to each week's recording or lesson and just please stay tuned uh, to, to follow that up. Switching gears now, I just want to say that it's been on my heart this past week of the number of people who have been laid off from jobs, who are going to be losing their jobs, and in, in the, the stress and the anxiety that comes from that. We know that many of you that are watching have probably already been affected by this. And, you know, you may be concerned how you're going to feed your family, how you're going to uh, pay the bills. Uh, you may be concerned about sickness in your family uh, or possibly contacting the virus. I know we have several health care workers here at work that, that are at Greenwood Park that are nurses and that this is a very real fear for them. And so before I lead us in prayer, I want to read these words from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Um, I came across this and I thought that these words are written for a time such as this. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are there, that you listen to us, that you are present. And we just thank you for your great and awesome power and for your love. Father, we just ask that you would be with us during this difficult time. We just pray that you would give us the wisdom and the patience and the calmness to know that you are in control, Father, and that you will protect us and that you will provide for us. Father, we just ask that you would help to relieve our anxieties and fears. Father, I just ask that you be with the health care workers, the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the technicians, and all first responders, and all those who attend to the needs of the sick right now, Father. We just pray that you would give them a special peace, that you would give them wisdom and guidance on how they work with patients. And Father, we also ask for your blessings upon our political leaders as they come up with solutions to this virus. We just pray, Father, that that you would help them not to make an issue a political one, that they will work together and do what's best for this country. Father, we know that you can take this situation, this pandemic, and you, we, you can use it for your good and your glory. We just pray that you do so, Father. We just pray that many people will come to realize that they need you in their life each and every day, not just during this situation, but but every day, Father, we just pray that you would help use us to, to help direct people in any way that we can, whether it's through social media 
or talking with them on the phone. Just pray, Father, for your, your wisdom and guidance as we interact with these people. Father, we just know that, that good will come from this situation, as you have promised, that all things work together for your glory. And Father, we thank you and we love you. We pray that you continue to be with us. And through the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. There is The scripture reading for today will be from Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and in the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. 
and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God, and you shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat underneath the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. You were the word of the beginning, one with God. Yours is the glory, yours is the name. 
Welcome to week two, day eight of whatever it is that we call this. Um, in fact, maybe it'd be good to have a contest where we come up with a name for all the days that we're counting down. Somebody want to come up for a specific name for this? Uh, uh, maybe we'll give you a roll of toilet paper for a uh, prize. Oh, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm in live uh, at church. No way laughed. Okay, anyway, we want to we wanna again welcome all the Greenwood Park family. Uh, our many guests who are here in Bowling Green, throughout the country, and different parts of the world. Uh, I say that because last week we had a thousand viewers plus during the course of the week. And most of you that know technology more than I know that uh, whenever you are on a device uh, and you go to the stream or you go to the YouTube um, channel, that it only shows up as one view. And in most cases, there were families and sometimes small groups that were watching. So I would say that it would be conservative to say that a couple thousand people are watching. We want to welcome everyone that is watching uh, that's not a part of Greenwood Park. And I would like to invite all of you that are watching, if you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, if you would take the time to do that after this is over with, to, to push subscribe, because we're trying to get to a thousand subscribers and how that will help. Uh, first of all, what it'll do for you is really nothing. You'll just get notifications and you can join us live if you want to or you'll know when there's something new available. But for us, it's going to be a big deal. It's going to provide a whole new world for us that will help us, uh, especially now that this is becoming a more important part of what we're doing. So if you'll take the time to subscribe, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Also, I'd love to hear from people that are... Uh, that are on stream, that are on on here, that are watching. Uh, especially if you are from somewhere else, if you're from another location, if you just uh, send me an email, this is my email address, and tell me where you're watching from. And um, and also, if you've got any prayer requests or any needs, we want to always keep that available during this time. So, uh, also, if you give me a, this is for Greenwood Park members as well. If you want to uh, have a prayer request, uh, feel free to send me send me that if you would like. Uh, so. There are other things, too, that uh, we know that we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know what this is kind of our new normal, and uh, by all appearances, it's going to be uh, several weeks. And so let me say this to our Greenwood Park members. Uh, the best way for you to stay posted on family news is to make sure that you are on the one-call email list. Now I know it's been mentioned before, but we're going to mention it a lot. There are three types of lists, and it could be that you're on the text list or the uh, phone list. And you may want to be on all of them. But the one that's going to be the most important during this time, we'll, we'll use all of them still, but the most important one's going to be the email list because on that list you'll be able to get um, um, attachments and you'll be able to get all kinds of information uh, that will be helpful to you and keep you posted on things that's going on with the uh, youth and with the children, which there are things on there now, and uh, HFCs and the YAHs and just general news about, uh, about the family and uh, people that we need to pray for and prayer requests. And so there's a lot of things that will be on that email that we can do with the email that we can't do with other things. I think that probably the social media also will be used as well. But still, make sure you contact Carly uh, or Vicki uh, if you would like to be added to the email list. Uh, Carly told us that last week we had several additions after Wednesday night. So we're excited about that and that'll, that'll help us keep everyone posted. Again, I want to encourage you to, to be involved in our Project 51 stories. Um, that's our reading one chapter a day, and this is where we are. We're, our theme this year is called Stories, and uh, we are in Judges, and this is the reading for this week. And uh, as you'll see, uh, this is very relevant to the time uh, that we are in as a nation and in our world. In fact, if you have Bibles, turn uh, to the passage that Josh read a few moments ago in Judges chapter 6. Uh, the fact is that God will share his throne and his glory with no one and with nothing. Uh, he has no equals and he is far beyond all else and he has no rivals either. Um, because to be a rival, to be a rival you have to have a fighting chance. And God is all alone. God is is victorious. God is the winner. Therefore, there is no one, no thing with a fighting chance against God. I want you to think about that now because regardless of what this is that we're going through, and I don't know how to, regard, I don't know how to say it any other way, so I may say that too much, I don't know, but no matter what this is that we're challenged with, it's, uh, if you'll realize that it doesn't have a chance to win. It's real, but it's not going to win. 
Because we're told in scriptures that because of Jesus Christ, because of the cross, because of the resurrection, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even trouble, not even distress, not even death. The victory's already been won through Jesus because God has no rivals. He loves to do something that, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it the Gideon. The Gideon. Now, the Gideon is not a dance. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, God chose the foolish things to confound the world, to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast. Now that we will call the Gideon. Or to define it differently, it's where God takes weak, humble, sometimes fearful people and uses them to do wonderful things, impossible things, even miraculous things. God loves doing that. And the story of Gideon has been repeated in many people's lives thousands of times throughout history. So let's look at the origin of this story and go back and read some of the verses that that Josh read earlier. Chapter 6, verse 1, it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them in to the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. There's a statement there, where there's several statements, but one that really catches my attention. And that is the statement, and Israel was brought very low. In fact, This is the lowest that they have been since leaving Egypt. Instead of land flowing with milk and honey, they lived in the caves and the clefts of the rocks, and they were too scared to even face their enemy. And what they did to get the plant, uh, to get what they did get the plant, excuse me, was destroyed by the enemy. And the Midianites weren't there at all the times. They just came at harvest time after the children of Israel had had worked and slaved for food for the winter. And the Midianites came in and they took what they had not worked for. It says they were like locusts in number, which kind of reminds me, you know how, I'll just make us feel at home here, reminds me of a movie. You've never heard me say that before. But it reminds me of Disney Pixar's second feature presentation after Toy Story, A Bug's Life. Parents, you're looking for something to do today? Uh, Maybe this afternoon you can watch A Bug's Life with your children. You can find it on Amazon Prime. I know most of you probably have Disney Plus. But in this story, the grasshoppers are basically like Midian, and the ants are like Israel. And I'll tell more about this at the end of the message because I do have a project for families. But back to our story for a moment. The Midianites would come in, and they would talk all that they had not worked for. They, they plagued, and they terrorized Israel. Really the opposite of what God had told Moses and Joshua would happen to them if they were obedient. In Deuteronomy 6 and Joshua 24, in those passages, God promised that they would live in houses that they did not build, that they would eat crops that they did not plant. But because of the choice that Israel made, this is completely the opposite. The Midianites come in and they bring strife. That's what the word Midian means, by the way. Interesting how that works. The Midianites brought strife to Israel. But interestingly enough, they are an example of God's mercy and grace. Because the truth is that sin robs us of what we work hard to gain. Sin promises pleasure and fulfillment, life and freedom. But it steals those things instead. That's why Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundant, but the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. And so what the thief does, Satan, the accuser, comes and he 
tempts us and tempts us with the idea of prosperity, with the idea of joy, with the idea of peace, and instead he steals the love, he steals the joy and the peace, and he ultimately brings strife in our lives. So let's look now at a few more verses. Verses 7 through 10. It says, When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord of God, the Lord God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt, brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. There are a few causes of strife, and of course the most prevalent cause of strife, and since we're going through the book of Judges right now, and you're not having your Sunday school classes and your Wednesday night classes. I'll just go ahead and handle something that probably those teachers would handle. And that is, one of the things that you'll notice as you read through Judges is there is a cycle. And this cycle just keeps going on and on. The cycle is the cycle of sin, for, better, for lack of a better term. Peace in the land. Israel serves the Lord. Then Israel does evil in the sight of the Lord. And God punishes Israel. Israel's enslaved. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge, a prophet. Israel's delivered. And that process goes on and on and on. Here we are in Judges chapter 6. And that cycle has already happened six times. Over the course of many, many years, it's happened six times that the people did this. Now, I want to tell you why, and it relates to some things that we have the opportunity to do. Really, the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, where it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. These commands that I'm giving you to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and get up. The Shema was the way that Israel was to pass on to the next generation the love of God, the power of God, the presence of God in their lives. And it's obvious that the parents had failed that very simple project. They had failed to let their children in on the goodness and the faithfulness and the greatness of God. Except for it seems like Gideon is one exception. Gideon had heard of these things, as we're going to see in just a moment. So when we think about one of the causes of strife is sin. But strife is not always because of sin. Sometimes strife just comes with the fact that we're in a fallen world. And bad things happen. And right now, in this city, state, nation, and the world... Probably the best explanation is that we are in this fallen world where there is disease and there is suffering and there's hurt. And that's why the Lord's Prayer is so important. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, uh, just bow with me where you are and let's pray that prayer. Pray that prayer from where you are. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Why is that important? Because Jesus said, when you pray, pray this. And one of the things that happens in this time is that we're praying. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying for things to be like they are in the kingdom of God. Well, there's no sin in the kingdom of God. And there's no strife of any kind in the kingdom of God. There's no sickness in the kingdom of God. So this prayer is a prayer and a plea to God, crying out to him to make things in our world the way they are in heaven. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread. That may not have really struck home with you before. There's a good possibility that it strikes home with us on a different level altogether right now. And he says, let us forgive, our, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, which is always relevant, always significant. And Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Deliver us from the evil one. And never forget 
that his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So regardless of what happens, regardless of what happens as believers, we are not victims because these things give God an opportunity to be God. Our greatest victories come in our greatest times of weakness. Strife oftentimes disappears in the midst of trial, melting away everything else except for what matters. How much of our time have we spent focusing on things that just don't matter? How much time have we spent not allowing, not spending time in the presence of God, not walking with God? How many times have we used things that now have stopped as reasons not to pursue God? And yet now, now this opportunity is ours. And in a difficulty, if there's anything good that comes out of it, it is that all that's left is what matters. And that's you. And that's the people in the room with you right now. That's the people that are watching this. That's the people in our community. That's the people in the world. That's people. It's relationships. And it starts with God. So, let's turn it on down to, to this experience in verse 11. Now, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abzerite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Or some versions, the one I got used to listening to, says, God is with you, mighty warrior. Can you imagine Gideon? I mean, he's hiding. He's scared to death. He knows what's coming. What's coming is inevitable. He's horrified. Then the angel of God comes and says, God's with you, mighty warrior. Can you, warrior, can you imagine the mighty angel of the Lord calling and, and coming there? I mean, what's he going to say? I mean, he's... Me? Who, me? Do you see where I am? Do you see what I'm doing? Are you sure you're not in the wrong place? You sure you're not talking to the wrong person? I mean, my hiding right now. My teeth are chattering. My heart rate's out of control. My palms are sweaty. But that's what he said. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And translated, man of valor, hero, strength and ability. I love that. Strength and ability. Here's this fearful man hiding from conflict. And God answers the cries of the people by sending an angel to Gideon, who's working hard to keep his grain and himself out of the sight of the raiders. He's hiding. But to his credit, he's not hiding under the covers or under the bed or in a closet. He's working to provide for his family. And that's a difficult lesson for us. Is it's all right to be frightened, but in the fear... You keep moving, you keep providing, you keep living. So the angel called Gideon a mighty warrior, even though he wasn't exactly playing that role. God's voice normally doesn't point out what we already know about ourselves. He certainly doesn't confirm those accusations that we hear from our guilty conscience or from the evil accuser that we're no good, that we're worthless, that we have nothing to give. But he calls out what he knows to be true of him of us from an eternal perspective. You see, God sees the end from the beginning. He saw Abraham as a man of great faith. Even when Abraham was questioning the promise, attempting to help God out, or laughing at the impossibility of the timing. He saw Moses as a great leader, even as he was fleeing Egypt in exile. And he saw Gideon as a warrior that Israel needed, even while Gideon was hiding in fear. He sees each one of us as the man or woman that we will become no matter how much we're struggling in the process. Because you see, through Christ, through Christ, the person that we will become is really the person that we are. Potential is reality. So hearing God's voice brings out the best in us. So let him call you who you are and don't question his assessment. 
And you may not feel like a mighty warrior. You may not feel like a person of great faith or anything else he calls you. But he gives his people an unquestionable identity. I love what Peter says. He says, but you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Whatever specific role that God speaks to you, it's true. Even if it seems unlikely, his words will call you out of hiding and into the glory of your destiny. And he will do it in this time. I want to ask you to listen just a moment. Let's just take a break, take a breath, and let this song speak to you. not forsaken I am who you say I am really Lord I find your words about me to be far more lofty than I deserve or expect help me grow into the vision that you have for me I'm everything that you say I am simply because you said so Lord give us that assurance and that faith In and because of Christ, we pray. Amen. So let's look at Gideon's response in verse 13. And Gideon says, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Check out that question. (laughs) I mean, isn't that our question? 
Lord, we come to church every Sunday. We have been taught in Sunday school and by our parents and in the Bible story books and through the Bible about your power and your intervention. But now you've forsaken us and you've given us into the hand of this plague that's going all over the world. If the Lord is with us, why is all this happening to us? Maybe that's the question that you have for the Lord right now. In this case, it was, it was Israel that had left God. It was their sin which led to the difficulty, and God hadn't gone anywhere. But not so much our situation. But maybe there are some applications. I mean, Gideon was focused, like most of us, on what God hadn't done, at least what he hadn't done recently. He had not protected Israel against Midian. He hadn't performed any dramatic miracles lately. He hadn't delivered his people yet. And so he asked the what-if questions, or if-then questions, assuming that God had been absent. And as I said last week, one thing that we know for sure in this situation is that God is here. He's here in this room. He's in your living room. He is wherever everyone that's in this is watching. He is with you in your room, in your house. He is in Italy. He is in Bowling Green. One thing we know, that God is alive and God is very much present. So the angel of the Lord responds to him turns to him and says, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. So the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and deliver Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not sending you? I mean, in Gideon's mind, victory over the Midianites was an impossibility. And he was absolutely right. The Midianites, along with their allies, overwhelmed the feeble Hebrews. Yet the moment God told Gideon to fight them, victory no longer was an impossibility. You see, when Jesus commanded his small group of followers to make disciples of all nations. Was that possible? Yeah, because Jesus said it was. When Jesus told his disciples to love their enemies, was he being realistic? Actually, he was. He showed that love as he died on the cross. Do you treat commands like these? Do you treat them like this? these commands as being implausible? Do you modify God's word to find an interpretation that seems reasonable to you? Because that's what we do. A lot of times in classes, we explain away the miraculous. We explain away the power of God. That was then. This is now. I mean, so many times what we've done is we've explained away what's in the Bible to the point that the God that we serve now, instead of being the God on the other side of the resurrection, is a God that does absolutely nothing. He just sits and watches. But that's not God. That's not the God that, which Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The God who strengthens us. When God gives an assignment, it's no longer an impossibility. It's an absolute certainty. How do you respond to assignments that seem impossible? Do you write them off as unattainable or do you immediately adjust your life to God's revelation? And watch with anticipation, anticipation to see how he will accomplish his purposes. God wants to do the impossible through your life. The only requirement is faith and the act of obedience. Gideon considered himself as the least of his family from the least family in his clan. And that's a common train of thought, but it isn't a good one. So God's answer to Gideon is the same one he gives to us in our skepticism. Go with the strength that you have. He turns our focus away from what's lacking and he puts it on what we have. In matters of faith, we need to have a glass half full perspective, not on the emptiness that remains. 
Instead, we need to be asking the question that was like the band that we had a while back, the green band that I wear every day. It's not the question, what would Jesus do? But it's, what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing? He is active. He's working. You see, that's why as parents, it's, it's so important for us to talk about these things when we sit at home and walk along the road and lie down and get up. That's why God's will for us is to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances, because that is a choice, a choice that we have to live by faith. We live by faith or we become completely paralyzed by fear. What Jesus did at the cross, and most importantly through the resurrection, empowers us to live by faith. You see, What you have and what God has done and what God is yet to do is always greater than any trial or difficulty that you're facing or will ever face, including this one. Let me say that again. What you have and what God has done and what God is yet to do is always greater than any trial or difficulty that you're facing or will ever face, including this one. So obedience to God is not just about keeping rules. In fact, rules have gone by the wayside with the activities. All that's left is what matters, and it's what's always mattered. And that is our relationship with him and people. And so God is constantly providing for us. And this essential truth to to grasp that if we want to experience God's presence, as long as we're asking why he wasn't there when that crisis happened or that mistake was made, if we're always asking what's lacking or what we think is lacking in our lives, we will not see him. That's just the way faith is. But if we focus on the reminders, you see, that's why we pray without ceasing. That's why we give thanks in all circumstances. We discipline ourselves to see the truth. This is what God's done for me. This is how God's providing for me. This is where God's presence is. And as a result, we go through life and we see his presence everywhere. And along with his miracles of provision and comfort, those things will become a regular experience and they'll become a regular experience in this crisis as well. You see, faith chooses what to see. And then seize it. So refuse to look at all the ways that you think God hasn't been there for you. Instead, look at all the ways that he has. Then no matter what's happening in this world, what trial, what persecution, that we'll be able to walk in relationship with God knowing that he's present, and he is. He's present to empower us. He's present to deliver us. He is present to defend us. God is with you, mighty warrior. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. Yeah. But take heart. I've overcome the world. And guess what? Just in case you didn't get what I said, if you look like a mighty warrior to God, then you are a mighty warrior. So let's end this practically as I want to do each week. If you're afraid this week, let me just say, if you're afraid this week and all the stuff, I just got a, I got one of those apps that gives me real-time statistics. I wish I hadn't gotten it. Because I'm telling you, I'm just going to be honest. I've been afraid. I've had some anxiety. I've had some worry. I'd say that my resting heart rate based on my watch that I'm not so glad I got for Christmas now, my resting heart rate is going up about an average of 10 per day. Yeah, it's real. It's real. It's not wrong. I mean, Jesus, our Savior in the garden, that's what he went through. He cried out, if it's possible, let this cup pass. He was paralyzed by fear, fear that was so great that he had sweat drops like blood. But ultimately, he focused on God and said, your will be done. 
So spend time in, in the Word this week because that's the truth. That's the truth. Choose to walk by faith. Uh, get involved and read the study. But You know, we went through something. Lori said something to me that I thought was interesting. She said something to me about uh, how, that who would have ever thought that that book that we went through, that one of the things that we were challenged to do would become obsolete in a few months. You know, it was bells, bless, and eat. Well, eat's out of the category. We can't do it anymore. Well, we had a member at our church that kept trying to get me to change from eat to invest. You won. We're going to invest because we can do that. Bless people. Invest in people. Listen to the Spirit. We've got time now to stop, listen, and let God speak to us. Tell us who we are in him. And learn Christ. Keep doing the Project 51 stories, but you've got time to read in the Gospels too, to read about Jesus, to read about him and emulate him. And ask, what is Jesus doing in this situation? And we got time to journal. So take some time to do that. Be a blessing to others. I mean, we got, we got Facebook, we got Instagram, and right now we still got social media. We still got face, uh, all these ways that we can FaceTime and Skype or whatever, and we can talk to people, and we can see people, and we can encourage people. And when somebody comes to your mind, don't just pray for them. Let them know you're praying for them. Let's connect with each other. Connect with your friends that don't know Christ. Tell them you're thinking about them. When you are thinking about them, let them know. I want to tell you a story about how this works. It's already worked this week. So our neighbor is just a lovely couple that live next to us. And uh, the gentleman that uh, lives there is a retired teacher, retired science teacher. And he is, uh, he is just constantly working in his yard. I mean, constantly. I mean, every, I'm not, I'm not ja- exaggerating. This is true. Every single day during the fall, he blows his leaves. He has a big yard. Every single day during spring and summer, he's mowing something in his yard. Just, and it's immaculate, as you can imagine. And it makes you really feel bad because I, I don't do all that. But he was diagnosed uh, a while back with leukemia. And uh, he's a very talkative person, very, very good neighbor. I mean, he does anything for you. He'll take care of our dog if we forget about it when we go out of town or something. But we had uh, something crazy happen in our neighborhood and Friday night of last week. And so I, I told Lori, I said, why don't you call him and, and see if he... Uh, heard it, and she called him, and she sa- he said, yeah, I-, I-, I heard it. And then he told her, because he's a very talkative person, he said, uh, I've been given two weeks to live, and uh, hospice is going to start Monday. And so Lori began to talk to him about his relationship with God, and he had chosen not to give his life to Christ uh, not because he wasn't a good person. His wife's a very faithful believer and goes to church every time the doors open. In fact, he told her, Lori, that every night she says, are you ready, are you ready, are you ready? And she cries about it. So he's that open with her. And Lori was telling her, I mean, and one of the reasons he gave was because he said, I, I went to this one church and the preacher called me out right there because I taught evolution in school. He said, I went to another church and... Actually, we're visited by some of the leaders because we weren't tithing on the level that we're supposed to. He says, yeah, I'm really, just really not interested. But he's a good person. And he loves God. I mean, he loves his wife and who loves God. But as you can imagine, she was in agony, the thought that possibly that he wouldn't be in heaven with her. So the other morning, it's Tuesday morning, we looked through the woods and we saw what appeared to be someone pick, body being put into a, a minivan, and sure enough, it was. A few hours later, the wife called Lori, and she said, in tears, I want you to know that he gave his life to Christ last night. He couldn't quit talking about the hour-long conversation he had with you. And... He gave his life to Christ. And the last words that he spoke, just a few 
moments before he died was, I've never had so much peace in my life. God can use you, mighty warrior. And you never know how. And you never know when. Another thing that I want to encourage you to do is to pray. Ryan sent this out. uh, uh, Lifeway. Yeah, Lifeway has put together this prayer journal, which will be a good thing. We'll put this in attachment. We'll put it on social media and other things. uh, And you get a better copy. You can get a copy of it through that. Um, let's consider praying over the next seven days for these things and joining in prayer with thousands, if not millions, of believers to pray for each of these things, some of the practical things that we do. Families, here's a project for you today. I think it would be awesome. Get a bug's life. Watch it. Watch a bug's life with your family after seeing this and going through the story of Midian. And think, ask the question, discuss the question with your family, with your children. How can God use what is weak and tiny to do great things? And then how can God use me? Be some great discussion, I think, that'll go on through that. I may even talk Lori into watching it. We'll talk about it. But, uh, and finally, one thing that we want to add to what we do each week is we want to give you a communion thought because we're not together to do what we really come together to do most often. And kind of in line with what we focused on today, uh, I want to encourage you after this is over with to have communion together with those that you're with or alone. Um, know that if you are alone, that people all over are having communion. Um, and so you're not alone. And God is there and present with everyone. And as you do it, just kind of meditate on and discuss this. How has the Lord shown himself mighty in our lives? And just have a time of positive um, focus on God and what he's done in our lives. And God told Gideon that he was a mighty warrior. What does God say to us through the cross? And what does God say to us through the resurrection? And how does that give us hope right now? Just have a discussion of that. Let that be your thoughts. And, and let's, let's all, if, if you can, let's, let's all try to do it uh, around this time so that we kind of have that feel and knowing that there are others experiencing that together. And I know that some of you aren't going to be able to watch this live and and um, that's okay, but uh, may those thoughts be with you as you think about Jesus and what he's done for us. God is with you, mighty warrior. I want to close with, um, I think I'll just make this my closing. I don't know if I'll make it every week, but again, I think it's very relevant. The words of Psalm 91. Those who go to God most high for safety and protection will be protected by the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, you are my place of safety and protection. You are my God, and I trust you. God will save you from hidden traps and deadly diseases. He'll cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you can hide. His truth will be your shield and your protection. I like this part. You'll not fear any dangers by night or an arrow during the day. You'll not be afraid of diseases that come in the dark or sickness that strikes at noon. The Lord is your protection. You've made God most high your place of safety. Nothing bad will happen to you. No disaster will come to your home. He has put his angels in charge of you to watch over you wherever you go. They'll catch in your hands so that you'll not hit your foot on the rock. You'll walk on lions and cobras. You'll step on strong lions and snakes. The Lord says, those who love me, I will save. I'll protect those who know me. And they'll call on me, and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and I will honor them and I'll give them a long, full life and they will see how I can save. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you his peace.